America's ailing housing industry now front and center at a summit in Washington, D.C. It's happening right now. Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner saying the current system of government support for the mortgage market is going to have to change. It is not tenable to leave in place the system we have today. We will not support returning Fannie and Freddie to the role they played before conservatorship, where they fought to take market share from private competitors while enjoying the privilege of government support. So a change is coming. How do we fix the housing market for millions of Americans who still want to buy a home or at least stay in the one they're in? Mark Calabria is the director of financial regulation studies at the Cato Institute. He's been attending this summit. Sam Chandon is president and chief economist of Real Estate Econom Econometrics. And real estate analyst Danny Babb is CEO of the Babb Group. Welcome to you all. Thank you for joining me today. Great to be here. Mark, starting off with you, just explain something really broad to us. Why do Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac matter to this economy, even if we're not homeowners? Well, they play a very big role in uh, facilitating the securitization of mortgages. That is, buying mortgages from lenders and putting them into uh, pools of mortgage-backed securities or holding them on their balance sheet. So, one, they are facilitating, with the help of the federal government, uh, keeping the mortgage money, money, mortgage money flowing. Uh, but even more importantly, I think, to the taxpayer, uh, as was mentioned, we are looking at at least 140. Uh, government estimates are somewhere in the range of $400 billion. I've seen your estimates in the range of a trillion dollars that we'll actually spend. Uh, and it's important to contrast this to the bank bailouts, the TARP. These are not investments. These are just covering losses, money we'll not, we will not get back. So if we're looking at spending somewhere from half a trillion to a trillion dollars to cover these losses, uh, I think everybody should set up and uh, take notice of that. Well, it sounds like it's a definitely a big number to take notice of. Sam, you know, as Mark was mentioning, these two entities, they loosen up the housing market. They allow business to really take place with a government guarantee that makes investors feel more comfortable. If we're investing that much money, maybe upwards of a trillion dollars, are we getting our money's worth? Well, I think the investments are structured as a senior preferred share agreement, and so we should be clear that um, this isn't public taxpayer money uh, that is simply being handed over to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, it is in the form of senior preferred shares, and there are obligations that go along with that, uh, payments that have to be made by the GSEs back to uh, the Treasury and the public purse. But will they ever pay that back, Sam? That is a great question. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, it, it really is uh, an open question right now, one that has to, uh, a lot to do with uh, what their future structure will be. Right now, we know that they don't generate enough income uh, to make the obligations that they've already taken on through this program. And so so this question of, well, how do we restructure them? What will housing finance look like? Which is a much bigger question than uh, just what do we do with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Both of these things are looming large. And unfortunately, right now, Jenna, um, there is no consensus that has emerged in Washington or in the public debate about exactly what housing finance should look like. Hey, Danny, you're a businesswoman on the ground level there dealing with real estate every day. You're dealing with housing finance as well. When it comes to loans being available at this time, is, is Fannie mm -hmm. Mae and Freddie Mac, are they helping the market? Or are they hurting it? No, they're hurting it. In fact, um, there's a controversial practice that they're using called rescoring, uh, where basically the buyer, right before they close, gets rescored again, literally the day of closing. And if that credit score has dropped or fallen below their standard, even because you charged groceries that month and it's something as simple as a $50 credit card balance, they're actually blocking the loan from closing. And we're starting to see that happen more often. It's great that they've tightened standards to something more appropriate, because obviously they were too lax in the past. But you can, you can over-tighten to the point where you actually start to hinder the market. And also, Fannie and Freddie, their requirements tend to drive what a lot of private lenders do or, or a lot of public banks. So the more we see them tighten, the more the entire market begins to shrink a bit as well. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. Danny, I want to show you something else that we have, a, a graph for our viewers that shows mortgage delinquencies right now. It goes back to the 1970s. And as we pull it up for you, you're going to see this huge spike. I mean, we haven't really seen a mortgage delinquency rates like this ever, about 10 percent of mortgages, at least one. Uh, late notice on some of them. What is your view on this market for the next 12 months, Danny? Do you think we're going to get a real recovery here? No, absolutely not. And, and the more we the more we try to use government regulation or tax breaks and so on to artificially prop the market, the worse off we're going to be rather than letting it play out. I think we're going to start to see the foreclosure numbers hit the four million mark. Um, and we also know that the, the loans backed by Fannie and Freddie have the highest number of foreclosure starts ever in the history of these organizations. So I'm not so um, I'm not very bullish, unfortunately, on the real estate market. There are obviously some great deals, but I think it's going to take some time to flush them through. You know, Sam, it brings up a broader question, though. Can government involvement 
actually help the housing market? I think most economists uh, are of the viewpoint, and certainly I can't speak for uh, you know the full array, but uh, th there's a really hard case to make here for uh, the government's footprint in the housing sector to be quite as large as it is, quite as large as it has been over the course of the last uh, decade or, or, or few decades. Um, ultimately, uh, what I think we can make a reasonable case for is a, a much smaller government footprint, government perhaps focused on ensuring the availability of affordable housing in more income-constrained neighborhoods, uh, but we do see that there are many other industrialized economies where uh, ultimately housing finance, home ownership um, is something that the private market is able to address quite well on its own. Mark, you've been inside that summit. Are you hearing that shift saying, hey, let's stick away from maybe some of these public programs and really rely on the private sector? Well, you know, it, it's surprising, and while there's a wide uh, divergence of views here being presented, I'm actually pleasantly surprised that there are a number of people, Secretary Geithner included, that are calling for a complete remake of the system and are calling to see more of that risk put back in the private sector. Now, it remains to see how this all plays out, uh, but there really is a lot of talk here about we need to kind of get more of this risk into the private sector. We need to take the taxpayer off the hook. And we need to ask more of our homeowners. We need to have people actually make down payments, and we need to have reasonable underwriting standards uh, so that we don't continue to have these housing bubbles every 10 to 15 years. Mark, is that even possible to have that really happen? Well, the question is going to be, you know, short-term versus long-term. I do think you need to find a glide path and a transition period where we can get the government out of this. Uh, but I do think, and this was just touched on, that there are many countries around the world. Uh, Canada, for instance, has actually has a home ownership rate higher than ours, and they don't have this level of involvement. Uh, so you can certainly do this in a way where the taxpayer is not taking all the risk and still get a relatively high home ownership rate. All right, final question for all of you, and this is the question that all of our viewers are asking. How long until we're through this? How long is it going to take to get back to a more quote-unquote normal real estate market? Sam, what do you think? I think it's going to take a number of years. As you pointed out with the delinquency and, and foreclosure rates, it would be unlikely that we'd see significant upward pressure on prices while delinquencies, foreclosure, short sales are still dominating market activity. And that's something that's going to make it very difficult. We also don't have a normalization around mortgage rates, in part because of the inflows and outflows as people see changes in the risk levels in other parts of the economy. Oh, look at that. We just lost Danny. Right. Maybe that was her answer. She wasn't quite sure about when the housing market was going to recover. I know how she feels. Feel. Sam, really quick on that, just want to follow up. You said a couple of years. I know economists don't necessarily like to give specifics on that, but what do you mean by a couple of years? You mean like two or you mean like 10? I think uh, you know, we would be looking <laughs> later on, uh, you know, a, a decade out potentially before we see wow. real normalization, robust activity in the housing market. One of the things we've got to be really careful of here, Jenna, is I know fo people have focused a lot of attention on, well, you know, how many new homes are we building? What's permitting like? Is that an indicator of housing health? In a lot of communities around the country, we need to be very careful about this. Um, Expansion of supply in housing um, is not necessarily something that's going to be helpful. Um, and we should be very careful about putting in place incentive programs that might encourage new development where it's not warranted. Yeah, so tough. So many construction workers out of work, and it, then we don't necessarily need those new projects. So it's a tough thing. Mark, real quick, how long uh, do you think it's going to take before we're seeing a more uh, regular housing market and maybe some better regulation, too? Oh, I have to largely agree with Sam on this. We're going to be a number of years, five or six minimum, before most parts of the country start to see uh, you know, solid appreciation. I actually think for the next year, in many parts of the country, we're going to see continued declines, probably you know, five, maybe even 10 percent in some places. So we're not through, we're through most of it, but not, we're, we're not through all of it by any means. Uh, and part of the problem is, and Danny touched on this, where you have all these government incentives, many of these government incentives have actually increased the level of supply production. In a lot of parts of the country, they're still building far more than they should be, and it's actually adding to the glut of housing rather than working it down. So we have a very long ways away before we're going to start working down the inventory. Uh, and it's hard to see mortgage rates going much lower, uh, and that's going to have uh, pressure down on house prices a year or two from now when they really start going up. Great point. All those homes, who's going to buy them? Low mortgage rates, but who has a job to afford it? Uh, well, I, I just bought, so it's not oh, necessarily all bad. Hey, you know, Mark, if, if that's you're good. Buy, if you're if you're going to buy for the long term and you're going to be there for over a decade and you like, make sure you love the house, then can go ahead and buy. But this is not a time to go in and think you're going to flip in six months or a year. Good point. Sam, did you buy a house too? Uh, in 2004, <laughs> I've uh, been able to hold my own so far. Well, that's good. You know, there's, there's some good news. At least there are some buyers in the market. Mark and Sam and Danny as well. We thank you all for joining us. Look forward to having you guys back soon.